Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey. Quite a nice group. Uh, we still have some people coming in. Um, great. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Rand. I'm uh, the CEO here at Zama. Uh, Pascal, also my co-founder, is here on the talk. And Martin, of course, who's going to be presenting today. Uh, just before we get started, just like to say a few words about FHE.org. So FHE.org is a community of people interested in homomorphic encryption. Uh, we have those monthly meetups where we talk about, uh, you know, very technical topics such as, uh, you know, lattices today, uh, as well as some specific use cases of FHE, for example, for, you know, private information retrieval or machine learning. So if you have good ideas of things you'd like to present, feel free to submit them to us and we'll do our best. Um, there is also a very active Discord server where people ask a bunch of questions uh, and you can also find some support uh, if you're using one of the libraries for homomorphic encryption, Concrete, Latigo, and all of these things. Um, we also have a, in March a conference in Tokyo, like a physical conference. Uh, I think we're going to be announcing that very soon as well. So if you want to hang out in person, uh, that's a great place to go. And as we've heard, you know, it was one of the best FHE conference last year, uh, which, you know, wasn't too hard because it's the first FHE only conference. So, <laughs> no, but, we, we, you know, uh, joke aside, uh, we put a lot of effort into creating a really good time for people attending so that we can kind of hang out. You know, this is a small community, so I think it's good everybody knows each other. Um, something else I'd like to announce today, um, it's not yet official, but it's going to be announced tomorrow, but hey, you might as well hear about it here first. Uh, we've just launched uh, a bounty program for Zama, uh, meaning that we just opened a set of challenges around homomorphic encryption, but also some machine learning based stuff for FHE uh, that people can participate in, can solve, and we are going to be giving over half a million dollars in prizes to people who are able to complete those bounties. Um, so you can just, I'll post the link here. Uh, so this is very new, it's very experimental. We have no idea if this is a good idea, uh, but the point is just to get you know as many people as possible to start contributing to homomorphic encryption in a way that would be, be beneficial to everyone. Um, great, so uh, without further ado, Martin, the floor is yours. All right, so let me first um, do the uh, obligatory, let me fiddle with my controls while I try to start sharing screen. Um, not anymore. Um, okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Martin. I am currently a professor at Royal Holloway University of London, and I will soon be a professor at King's College London and a principal research scientist at Sandbox AQ. Um, I look at the difficulty of solving hard lattice problems. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I should mention probably the most interesting fact about me is that my Erdős Bacon number is six. With that out of the way, let's talk about estimating the difficulty of breaking um, uh, lattice-based cryptography with a focus on LWE. Oh yeah, I should be able to see when you ask questions in the chat. So feel free to pop them there. Um, if I miss them, then somebody can also alert me to that by kind of shouting at me or something. Okay, so what I plan to do today is to uh, talk you through like the cost of solving LWS based schemes. So I'll first talk about some strategies and in particular the primer and the dual lattice attacks. I will talk about the lattice reduction, how that works, um, which in turn depends on something uh, called finding short vectors. And then I will also kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, what can quantum computers do? And I figured in the context of this meeting, it's probably useful to talk about binary secrets. And along the way, I want to introduce how to use uh, this lattice estimator, which I'm maintaining which is a Python script, so um, about estimating the cost of lattice-based schemes. And I will also, uh, as we go along, kind of highlight some limitations in the hopes that maybe kind of some of you feel inspired to contribute to it. So uh, let's do that. 
So maybe kind of let's first start uh, kind of with um, uh, how the output of this lattice estimator looks like. So um, so you you essentially ask it to give you a rough estimate of like how hard is it to solve uh, the Kaiba uh, 768 parameter set. And then you can ask it to kind of spend a bit more time on kind of getting more precise estimates. And the idea is that by the end of this talk, you, you understand kind of at least what some of these lines mean in terms of like, what does it tell me about the kind of this, the security of Kaiba. So let's start with some computational problems. So the key computational problem that we are tackling here in this space um, is, the, um, is the learning with errors problem. And the search version, which I'm focusing on here, is that I give you A and C, where A is a matrix of dimension M times N mod Q. And then um, I multiply A by some vector S, and I add some error vector E to it, and I then hand out the result, which I call C. And I'm now uh, kind of asking you to find S. right? So it's if the vector E is just 0, then it's a trivial linear algebra problem. But, uh, and if the vector E is uniformly random, then it's an unsolvable problem. So uh, the learning with errors problem, the key point is that uh, what we're looking at here is um, these vectors E, uh, the vector E has small entries. Okay, so what we mean by small entries is classically, we mean the discrete Gaussian distribution, right? So some distribution that looks roughly like the Gaussians that you're known to, but like restricted to the integers. And that would be kind of the, the proper kind of, you know, the, the distribution that maybe theory implies or, you know, some other variants of some Gaussian distribution. And I, I give a little picture of like, you know, to kind of visualize this. Um, so that would be traditionally what we use. It's a bit annoying to sample from, um, and it turns out for learning with errors, as far as we know, it doesn't really make that much of a difference um, that you're sampling this distribution from a Gaussian exactly. So other choices that people have used and explored is the binomial distribution. So you're just sampling some random bits, you subtract them, and then you, you sum them up. Um, and then this gives you something that looks a little bit like a Gaussian, but isn't quite. Or you could just sample from a small uniform distribution. And the way we essentially think about them in this uh, lattice estimator is that they're more or less equivalent, right? So you can we have like some sort of functions where you can say like I'm going to build a discrete Gaussian with some standard deviation. I'm going to build some centered binomial. Or I'm going to build some uniform distribution. And if you pick the parameters right, then they all have the same standard deviation. They all have mean zero. And we pretty much assume that they all behave the same kind of modulo some corner cases. And the uh, second point to make is so I haven't specified the distribution of S. And you may think of the distribution of S being the same as the distribution of E, the error. And that is because there is no loss in security by having them uh, the same distribution. OK, so that gives you essentially everything you need to know in order to construct a, uh, an LWE parameter set, right? So we need some dimension n of the secret. We have a modulus q. Then we have uh, a secret distribution, a noise or error distribution. And then m is the number of rows of our matrix or the number of LWE samples, right? And then this is kind of what we mean by LWE in the context of this estimator and estimating hardness. A natural question to ask at this point, how do I do entry? Um, and the answer is that's very easy. You just implement it and send us a patch. Um, at the moment, you can you can you can hack it uh, together, like so you can you know like wedge it into some LWE parameters, but that's not that's not nice. And you're missing also some some directions. And so it would be nice to do this. Uh, so and it's on our roadmap, but maybe you know one of you wants to help. Okay. So we have our computational problem. Let's talk about approaches for solving it. And so the first um, approach is the unique SVP or BDD approach. And so we, we're starting with um, A times S plus E equals to C mod Q. And from that, we can observe, well, if I multiply my S by A, and then I kind of subtract the appropriate multiples of Q, and then at C, then I get E out. 
and similar if I multiply s by the identity then obviously you get s out so that means um, I can put all of this into one big matrix b and can say well if I multiply this matrix b from the right by some vector to represent the modular reductions I multiply it by s and then uh, the uh, integer one then I get a vector e s and one out right that's the concatenation so put differently from the formulation of the LWE problem, I know that if I construct then given A and C, my uh, matrix over the integers B, that there is a linear combination, an integer linear combination of the columns of B that is short because I know that E, S and one are short. So there is an, and indeed these are going to be unusually short. I'm going to define what unusually short uh, means a bit later in this talk. Right, so I have this uh, integer uh, matrix, and there are integer linear combinations that give me something short. And so that's a classical lattice reduction problem. So that means what we what we can try to solve is the unique shortest vector problem for QRE lattices, and that is find some unique shortest vector amongst these integer combinations of the columns. And we can also define a decision variant where we only need to answer if an unusually short vector exists, right? So it does this because I construct it like this. If C is uniform, then I don't expect some unusually short vector in this um, in the span. So um, it might not have one. So just deciding on whether this thing has contains an unusually short vector would be a decision variant of this problem. Now, that was the roughly the translation of how to translate um, LWE into the primal uh, um, lattice problem, um, the unique SVP approach. And the other approach is the approx SVP or SIS translation. And that is, again, we are considering C is equivalent to A times S plus E modulo Q and S and E are both short. And now let's say I have an oracle that gives me a short vector so that's when I multiply it from the left with A, I get a VI out that is also short. And now let's kind of multiply this guy by C, right? So then I plug in what, um, uh, what that means if C is defined as AS plus E. Then I multiply the U by AS and I multiply the U by E. And since I know that U times A is V, so I get V uh, multiplied by S and U multiplied by E. And now I have that V is short, S is short, U is short, and E is short. So their product and their sum is again somewhat short. But on the other hand, if C was uniformly random, then I would get something out that is uniformly random. And so we can use this to distinguish on what we have before us is an LWE sample or not. And so, and then the shorter, of course, the, um, the value is that we get, like the more distinct it is from the uniform distribution. So the shorter UI and VI, the fewer samples we need to consider. So what we're looking at is um, some way of, um, some way of um, um, finding a combination of this, uh, of this uh, lattice um, on the left that I multiply by to get um, a short vector vi ui out, right? So I multiply something by a and I get a vi out and then multiply the same thing by the identity get, get ui out. Okay. So that gives us the shortest vectors for, uh, for QRA lattices. So that, that is find some vectors ui vi of some sh uh, small norm uh, kind of in the integer combinations of this lattice B. And we can, this is the distinguishing variant, like we can use it to distinguish LWE, but we can also extend this to recover S. And what we're doing here is we guess a component and then we run our distinguisher. Um, we can both approaches, we can augment with a combinatorial step. Essentially you guess part of the secret um, and then you run the lattice attack on a smaller dimensional lattice. Lattice, um, and roughly speaking, these costs are additive, not multiplicative, because everything is kind of linear, right? So roughly speaking, 
why do combinatorial attacks uh, combinations with lattice reduction make sense is because the, the overhead is not multiplicative. Okay, so in this context, like now might be a good time to talk about binary secrets, which is, um, I understand, a bit of a hot topic in FHE land. And in particular, there was a paper in 2020, so, or preprint in 2020, that uh, concluded that binary secret was less secure than, for example, a discrete Gaussian distribution. Right? There was their, their big takeaway. And what they did is they took some experiments that we have done uh, previously in 2017 and replaced the secret distribution there, which was um, some discrete Gaussian distribution with a binary secret distribution, and then found that uh, these instances were solved smaller. And then uh, shortly after, uh, Fernando and Eamon published a paper at PKC where they kind of uh, discussed this paper and found that this indeed does not imply that binary sequence is less secure because what the, the mistake that the authors of this preprint made was to uh, not account for the width of these distributions. Right, so when I talked about these distributions uh, at the beginning, I said like we kind of essentially care about the standard deviation and what they were comparing was a distribution of a wider discrete Gaussian distribution with a, a bigger standard deviation compared to the standard deviation of like a binary or ternary secret. And so um, in that sense, uh, the conclusion was simply one about like, yes, if you have essentially a smaller error, then of course the instance uh, becomes uh, uh, easier to solve, but it's not a question of the distribution, but more a question of the width of the distribution. And indeed, we have good evidence that um, binary secrets uh, distributions are fine. Um, my understanding of the latest in this field uh, would be the Entropic LWE work, which essentially concluded that if you have a binary secret LWE distribution in dimension n log q, that is as hard as a regular LWE in dimension n. So it says like there's a loss, you need to have a bigger dimension if you um, to account for the binary secret, but um, but there is um, the overhead is log Q. So my understanding of the latest in the literature and might have missed something that the state of the art is still that N log Q is what you need. Um, I'm pretty sure like a proof is on the horizon that N log Sigma is all you need. And of course, for FHE parameters, that would make a big difference because sigma is often a small constant, whereas Q is massive, right? So in terms of concretely, it would really tighten uh, kind of our understanding of like um, what's the gap between binary secret um, and uh, some secret that follows the error distribution. And I just want to stress that there, no attack comes close to mandating n log q. So the n log sigma is a lot more realistic from the perspective of like what are the attacks capable of doing. So in particular, in terms of attacks, so there is the Kirchner and Fug attack um, that is a variant of BKLW, um, and there they give a slightly sub-exponential attack um, in dimension n uh, when you have a binary uh, LWE. Um, and then there was uh, a series of works on hybrid attacks kind of improving kind of those. So like there has been kind of um, a lot of cryptanalytic work of kind of trying to exploit this additional uh, information that your secret is binary. All right, so what we have is we have this USVP approach. Um, so that's what we uh, say when uh, mean when we say primal USVP in the estimator. Then we have something called primal BDD in the estimator, which is essentially the same thing, except that we relax some parameters. So we can, uh, you know, like we, we, we decouple two parameters that will be the same in the USVP approach, and then we call this BDD uh, in the estimator. And then, as I mentioned, you can compose this with combinatorics for the Kyber parameters. This doesn't uh, kind of seem to be too promising. The costs are going up. And then we have the dual attack. Again, there's this kind of plain cis approach that I kind of outlined earlier. And then again, you can combine it with combinatorics. And then indeed, like this is uh, quite beneficial. You may have heard of a paper by Matsov, uh, this IDF unit who improved uh, the dual attack um, um, recently. 
Um, and we don't have that in the estimator yet, but I have that Python script uh, kind of in a preprint that uh, Yixing and I wrote. So all you need to do is extract it from there, I guess. And that is maybe kind of a good point to mention is like things are happening in this space uh, when somebody needs it for a project. Like so in most researchy open source projects that are kind of, you know, driven by academics, realistically something gets implemented in this project because somebody needed it for a paper. And so the best way of making sure that these lattice estimators kind of stay up to date is when uh, people have new algorithms or improvements to algorithms that they submit patches to the estimator. So please do that if that's the sort of work that you do. Okay, so we have our strategies and they both kind of boil down to finding short vectors and lattices. So let's talk about lattice reduction. For this, let's uh, introduce some quantities. Um, and the first one is the volume of the lattice. And that's the volume of the fundamental parallel pipette. So whatever basis you have for your lattice, it spans an area. And that area is the volume of the lattice. And that's an invariant, of course, um, of it doesn't matter which basis you pick, because it's invariant of the, of the lattice. It's a quality of the lattice rather than of the basis that you choose. Now, the Gaussian heuristic predicts that the number of lattice points inside any measurable body is approximately equal to the volume of this body divided by the volume of the lattice. And if now you pick as your measurable body Euclidean D bolts, so, you know, bolts in D dimensions, um, then this means that the shortest vector has expected norm, roughly this expression in square root D over some constant uh, times the dth root of the volume. So what this means is if you have, if you pick a lattice sufficiently at random, then you expect a vector to have roughly this norm, right? So um, as a function of the volume and the volume is something that you can compute. So you can, you can easily predict what you expect um, this, uh, this vector, the norm of this vector. And then now I can define what I mean by unusually short. And that means if a lattice contains a vector that is significantly shorter than that, then we say this is an unusually short vector. We will also need uh, Gram-Schmidt vectors. So you now have to uh, remember some, some linear algebra. Um, and in particular, um, the uh, Gram-Schmidt vector BI star is the orthogonal projection of BI relative to the space spanned by the previous vectors. So informally, what this means is like you have your vectors, and then you add the ith vector, and then you take out all the contributions in the direction of the previous vector, and you're only left with the thing that is in the new direction. And so I have a little uh, kind, of, um, kind of illustration here. So we have this B1, and then we're taking out all the contributions direction of B0, and then we're left with B1 star. And in particular, what we then have is everything's orthogonal, then the volume of the lattice is simply the product of the norms of these Gram-Schmidt vectors. And the reasons why we like to introduce that is because uh, we like to draw these sort of plots. And what you have here is I computed the Gram-Schmidt vectors um, of um, a basis, of an input basis. And then I computed their norms and took their logarithms. And then I plotted these logarithms from index zero to the dimension of the lattice. And this input shape is uh, known as the Z shape. Um, and the reason why, it's, uh, why it occurs is because we have this uh, Q structure in our QRI lattices. And so what you're seeing there is that essentially the first vectors all have norm Q. And then when you project orthogonally, the, the remaining vectors all have norm one. And so that's the input shape that you get kind of when you commence on lattice reduction, kind of at least in the area of um, LWE and more broadly, most of cryptography, your input shape would look something like this. And then you run the famous LLL algorithm, right? So the kind of um, most well known and the, the main lattice reduction algorithm, which only gives you um, exponential approximation factor. And then you get a shape that looks like this, right? So you get this kind of line with um, kind of a somewhat steady slope. Um, and that is kind of the, the shape that you expect after lattice reduction. And indeed, there's a famous assumption um, in analyzing lattice algorithm called the geometric series assumption. And that is that the shape after lattice reduction is a line. 
And the essentially what you're doing in lat subduction, you make this line flatter and flatter. And so the so if if you use stronger and stronger lattice reduction, what you do is you push the front of this um, this this line downwards because you know like the first one in particular is the shortest vector that you have in your basis because you're projecting the first vector orthogonal to nothing. Um, and then if you push that down because the product um, of the Gram-Schmidt norms is the volume of the lattice, that means the sum of the logs of the Gram-Schmidt norms is like the area under this uh, under this line has to remain constant. So if I push down at the beginning, it needs to go up at the end. And what we expect, roughly speaking, is that we get this line and it gets a bit flatter kind of if we use stronger and stronger lattice reduction. And so what does stronger lattice reduction look like? Um, and the way kind of it proceeds, the most famous algorithm would be the DKZ algorithm, and it also roughly represents the state of the art. And the way it works, it uses an oracle. So say I have some magic oracle that will solve the shortest vector problems um, in a lattice up to some dimension. So here this dimension is five. So I want to reduce the basis of a Bigger, bigger lattice of a bigger dimensional uh, basis. I want to reduce that. But I have available an oracle that will give me the shortest vector or a shortest vector to be more precise in dimension up to five. So what I can do is I can take the first uh, five vectors of my basis and I can submit them to the oracle and I can say like, could you please return a shortest vector in this lattice to me that is spanned by these five vectors. And then what we do is we insert this additional vector and then essentially run the LLL algorithm to deal with uh, linear dependencies. But essentially, uh, we in some shape or form replace the first vector by this new kind of shortest vector. And now we move on. And now what we're doing is we kind of not going to take the next five vectors, but we're going to take those five vectors and we're going to project them orthogonally to the first vector. So we're going to take out all the contributions of the first vector and we're going to consider that basis, right, projected orthogonally. And this, again, kind of is a lattice. Um, and we can, again, ask our oracle, could you please give me a shortest vector for this particular lattice? The oracle will oblige. It will return a vector, and we insert it. And we keep on going until we hit the end, and then we start at the beginning again. That's it. So the BKZ algorithm is essentially do this, pick a block, ask for a shortest vector, insert it into B, go on to the next one, and keep on going in circles, which we call tours, and then until this thing doesn't change anymore. And eventually, it will stabilize and will give you the BKZ reduced basis. And then the um, it will not surprise you to hear that this uh, parameter beta, in which I can solve this, uh, the shortest vector problem, um, this uh, influences um how how good the lattice reduction is so if i do this in dimension two then this is roughly the LLL algorithm and i get um a, a root hermite factor we call it that is uh, roughly 1.0219 uh, and don't worry i will not read out the other root hermite factors and so as i increase beta then what i have is the the root hermite factor drops and the the output of my of my lattice um, will be for the cis approach is roughly this root Hermite factor to the power of D times the D root of the volume will be the expected size of my output after BKZ reduction with block size beta. And for the BDD approach, where we not so much care about as the size of the short vector in relation to the volume, but we asking how much longer is the vector that is output than the shortest vector in the lattice. So if I have an unusually short vector, then the BKZ algorithm will find me a vector that is at, at most an exponential factor larger than this um, than this shortest vector. And the idea then of the attack is, well, if there is no vector that is that only that much larger than what this algorithm will do, it will actually output the shortest vector. And we have a fairly good understanding of how this root Hermite factor behaves for random lattices as we increase beta. So if beta is like 50, which is something you can do in milliseconds on your on your PC, so this is very small, um, then uh, we have a good idea of like what this d beta kind of would be, um, and we can predict this, and indeed the estimator does this for you. 
And then under the geometric series assumption, we can also then derive uh, what is the slope of this graph, right? So we have a pretty good idea of what is the output shape of lattice reduction before running it. And then in practice, the way it behaves is so the GSA would be the prediction of what would BKZ60 do on this lattice. And uh, the red line is the actual, is the LLL kind of shape. Uh, so like um, I pre-reduced my basis with LLL. And then I keep doing these tours. I mentioned we keep doing these tours until nothing changes. And then um, we are slowly approaching uh, kind of this black line, the GSA, right? And so I think how many tours am I doing? I think I'm doing eight and I start counting at zero. And so like now this is fairly close and you will see that this is not quite identical. There's a slight deviation at the beginning and at the end. And we will talk about that uh, in a sec. Okay, and then you can actually run the BKZ algorithm if you have a copy of Sage, um, because it's uh, FPLL implements kind of one version of this BKZ algorithm, so you can you know like see how this behaves um, at home uh, in these kind of uh, links. You don't need to write them down. I will share kind of these slides online um, after this talk. So we can now predict um, the shape of uh, the lattice after BKZ reduction. Um, and that also in particular implies th the length of a vector that is output. So we, in that sense, we have an estimate of how long is a vector that is found by BKZ when we run it with a particular block size beta on a particular input lattice. So that kind of solves of like how to estimate how, what is the cost of doing this SRS um, or dual approach. But we still have to establish when does the primal approach succeed. And that is, when do we find this unusually short vector um, in our input lattice B? And here, the key observation is, so we have this uh, black line, which is the expectation of what BKZ would output after, um, after it has completed in some block size. And the dotted line is, what do we expect the projection of this uh, unusually short vector? How long would it be if I start projecting away from dimensions? So essentially, um, what do this is a vector that is uh, supposed to be in my lattice, and its projections are supposed to be in the projections of this lattice, and then what's the norm of these projections? And now when I hit the index D minus beta, so that's the last beta size block, in that, at that point, if my expected norm of the projection is shorter than what BKZ would expect, then by the guarantees of the shortest vector oracle that I'm calling on this large beta dimensional block, I end up, um, I would get the projection of this unusually short vector because this SVP oracle is guaranteed to give me a shortest vector and a shortest vector definitely is a projection of ES and one. So at that point, the, the SVP oracle will return a projection of ES and one. And then it turns out it only takes essentially one call to LL from this to recover ES and one. And so, so essentially when you have this intersection, when you have this condition met that the dotted line is slightly below the solid line at the index D minus beta, then you win. And then this is the expression then kind of um, uh, also below the plot um, that was kind of uh, first put forward in the new hope paper. But it's like, if you have that relationship, then the primal attack succeeds. And indeed, uh, follow-up work then confirmed this is how this thing actually behaves. So they only kind of said like, we expected this is the behavior of the primal attack. And then into follow-up works, uh, one of them I had already mentioned by Eamon and Fernando, um, they, um, we, we confirmed, uh, and then they confirmed kind of like this is indeed experimentally kind of what you, what you get. So we have a pretty good understanding of how this works, but I want to kind of come back to uh, the GSA because it turns out that's a lie. Um, and, you know, as I said, the GSA kind of asserts that we have a line. Uh, all the way through through our basis, but we don't actually have a line. We have um, a bit of a curve, in particular at the end. Uh, we like to call this the HKZ shape, 
And for that, we have efficient simulators. So you can essentially simulate the behavior of the BKZ algorithm efficiently, uh, even with large block sizes and in large dimensions. Um, and with that, you get this green shape, and this green shape is, is, is really close to kind of what you expect in practice. Um, and this difference of GSA or using a simulator does make a, a difference for security parameters. So when you call LW estimate rough in the estimator, then because it's a lot quicker, we assume the GSA. And then here you get uh, like a cost of uh, 204.9. But if you actually run the simulator, which is a bit more expensive, but it's still something that you, you, know, you can do um, to estimate these parameters, then you get about five bits more. Um, in terms of cost, right? So a factor of two to five more in this cost by just kind of having a more precise. So there's a question in the chat. So GSA is the geometric series assumption that I mentioned earlier that what we see is the shape is um, A line. Okay, so we have a pretty good idea of um, what is the output of the BKZ algorithm, and we have a pretty good idea of when it succeeds in either the primal or the dual attack. So we need to talk about cost. How expensive is the BKZ algorithm? And the first thing is, so we're calling tau tours, and then roughly in each tour, we're calling our SVP oracle d times. So overall, we call our oracle roughly tau times d times. And so whatever the cost of our SVP oracle is, like we multiply that by tau and d, and then we get roughly the cost of running this BKZ algorithm. And it's a bit rough because in the tail, we don't actually run full dimensions, but actually the blocks get smaller. It's actually a bit less than d. It's maybe more d minus beta. Um, we will also pre-process our bases with smaller block size before running in bigger block sizes. That makes it slightly cheaper. And we might do tricks like skipping some blocks, right? So instead of moving on to the next block, we move on to the next block over um, because we might think it's actually not, not that useful to reduce the next block. And so there's some tricks we can play. Um, one conservative away, uh, takeaway could be to say like, we're just going to assume we need one SVP Oracle call, right? We just, yeah, whatever, like uh, we say tau times D, ignore it. It's just going to be at least one call to an SVP oracle. Um, and so that's what we assume when you uh, use rough. Uh, when you use the full estimate, then we assume it's roughly eight tours. And that's frankly based on kind of some, some experiments I did at some point and eight seemed okay. Um, and the, uh, and that, makes a big difference, right? So whether you multiply the cost of your SVP oracle um, by uh, A times D, and then how much you think it costs to run your SVP oracle, um, I will talk about this in a minute, um, makes a big difference, right? So there might be 20 bits of difference in terms of what you estimate the security is. It's because rough is, uh, is it makes a lot of kind of judgment calls of like, yeah, it's going to be at least. So it's really meant as a, Kind of conservative lower bound. Okay, so at this point, you can you can read the output of the estimator, right? So Rob is the number of operations. Uh, for some reason, I called those ring operations at some point. Then red is the number of operations that you we were doing during lattice reduction itself. Uh, beta is the BKZ block size. E Theta is the dimension of this last final oracle call, and d is the dimension of your lattice. And this eta is, I mentioned at the beginning, you succeed when d minus beta, uh, when that condition is met. But there you have some wiggle room, because we do eight times d SVP calls to pre-process our basis, and then we have this one final call where we finally win. And then we can make that a little bit more expensive, because uh, we don't do eight times d many of them. So that's what this parameter eta comes from. That's what we mean by big, uh, primal BDD. Okay, before I move on to kind of like how do we instantiate these oracles, let me talk about how do you do estimate the hardness of sys, not LWE. It's kind of implicit because for the dual attack, we do have to estimate the hardness of sys because we're solving actually sys in order to solve LWE. However, we don't have a nice high-level interface, so it's easy just send us a patch. 
And then how do you verify that our code is actually correct? That is also very easy. You just check our code and send us a patch if it's wrong. All right. What remains open is how to solve SVP. Um, and here there's two families. Um, but in terms of if you only care about security estimates, you can even ignore one of them. So on the one hand, there's enumeration, and that is essentially an exhaustive search in some ball. And this is quite sensitive to the quality of your input basis. And it's a super exponential running time. So it runs in time B log beta in the exponent or beta to the uh, beta. But the memory is polynomial. On the other hand, there's sieving. So that is essentially kind of you use a collision search uh, in order to find new short vectors is fairly oblivious to the quality of the input basis. It's exponential in time and in memory. And for security estimates, because we usually ignore the impact of memory, so we just assume memory is free, which is you know, a very questionable assumption, but it's one that is routinely made. And then it is pretty clear the only thing you have to worry about is sieving. Um, and so you would be um, conservative in doing that. But let me talk about enumeration because I quite like it. Um, and it's very brief, I promise. So what you do is you pick some enumeration radius. And so for example, you pick the radius that is the norm of the currently shortest vector in your input basis. So, you know, like whatever the norm of the shortest vector in your basis is, well, it's gonna be kind of, you know, at, um, at most the thing that you already know you have. Okay, so you pick some, pick some radius and then you start projecting everything uh, downward. Uh, kind of to one dimensions at first, right? So you just say project everything down to uh, one dimension. At, and then um, you um, that gives you a new one dimensional lattice where you can now in, in integer jumps kind of can jump on these points. And for each of these points, you then you then walk these points. And for each of these points, you then lift up. Right, so what's the, if I now go back to the next higher dimension, dimension two, what's the norm of this vector? And there again, you have the same thing. You have these integer points by which you can hop and then you lift up. And then you check what's the norm of this guy. And so uh, you get a bunch of these vectors um, and then you just simply keep the shortest one after you've completed this process, right? So it's an iterative process. You go down to one dimension, you lift and see where you're at, you lift and you see where you're at, and you, you keep on kind of going back and forth in some search tree. And then at the end, you get a shortest vector out. You can speed up this whole thing by instead of searching the entire space where you're sure you find the shortest vector or a shortest vector, um, you just say like, actually screw it. I'm going to only search an exponentially small search space or like a search space that has exponentially smaller probability of success. And then I'm going to repeat this exponentially often. And it turns out that is better. So because the, the algorithm is quite expensive and you get an exponential speed up in the algorithm by doing kind of that sort of thing. And I had already mentioned that enumeration is quite sensitive to the quality of the input basis. So it makes sense to use quite strong pre-processing so that the input base is already quite reduced by the time you call your SVP operator. And then when you put all of that together, then you get, um, so you first, uh, there was some improvements of tricks you can play inside BKZ um, in order to speed up the SVP oracle that gives you kind of some improvement in the leading uh, constant. And then you can play some further tricks of buying by being a bit loose about like what you're asking for. They give you some lower um, level improvements. And so with this, you get like the, the different cost models that, as they are on the estimator that tell you kind of what's the cost of enumeration, right? And so the thing that matters to you is the last one, the latest one uh, the, here that gives you the two, seven, eight. Sieving as I mentioned, is mostly a collision search. So what you do is you sample an exponentially large number of vectors and put them in one big database. And then you compare them pairwise. And you say like, well, if I subtract this vector from that vector, do I get a shorter vector? And if you do, then you keep it. And you keep on going. That is roughly sitting. Um, when does this succeed? Well, uh, in order to analyze it, let's just pretend 
pretend that all of these vectors are, have the same norm. They won't quite, but like, you know, maybe that's a good enough approximation. And then if you pretend that they're all the same norm, then you kind of like, you know, normalize, normalize their length. And then essentially it comes down to a question of the angle between them, right? So like, you know, what's the angle between them that tells you if I subtract them, do I get a short vector? And from that, we can then um, work out the probability what happens, uh, what is the probability that two randomly drawn vectors on the unit sphere in dimension D kind of have sufficiently small angle so that they actually get something shorter out. And then what you end up with is this four over three over D over two, right? So that's the number of vectors you need until you have a collision, so to speak. And so you need roughly this many vectors and then you do a pairwise comparison. So you square that cost and that's where you get the uh, the, the complexity of the simple heuristic SIF, right? This 0.41 in the exponent. You can do a bit better. You can say like, maybe I don't need to compare everything with everything. Maybe I can put my vectors into buckets, right? So if I take like some pretty wide bucket and then I everything that lands in this bucket, I pairwise compare and everything that doesn't, like I don't even compare. And so that means you're losing some stuff at the boundaries of the bucket, but the probability of things landing exactly on this boundary is fairly small. So it's a, it's a cost that you can accept. And so uh, what you're doing is you pick some centers and then you say like, well, if W and C are somewhat close, then perhaps uh, and uh, V and C are somewhat close then maybe W and V are somewhat close. So we put them into these buckets and then we only do the quadratic search in there. And the BGJ SIF uh, does essentially that for random centers, and that gives you an improvement in the leading constant. And the state of the art is essentially to say, um, um, I'm going to use coding theory to decide which bucket I land in. So I don't have to do a check for every bucket, but I can uh, decide a priori uh, what bucket I land in. There's a question. Uh, yes, you can have overlapping buckets and they will overlap a bit, but you, of course, want to minimize the, the number of buckets uh, and the size of the buckets. So there's a trade off. So it would be a little bit of, a, of, a, of, of an overlap, but you're really not optimizing for capturing everything because you, like the, the loss is, is fairly small because you need to be exactly kind of in this boundary condition. Uh, we have implemented this in Jessica, which is a Python C++ framework for experimenting. So you can try all of this at home and all of these algorithms are, are implemented uh, kind of in this uh, serving algorithms. And then we take uh, somewhat of a stateful reviewing serving as a stateful machine, which is where we get a lot of the concrete speedups out. So you can, you can try this at home. And um, with this, so sieving really outperforms enumeration um, at very small dimensions. So at roughly dimension 70 here, so that's a running time. So that's SVP in dimension 70. Um, that takes about 10 seconds um, on my laptop. And that's roughly where the crossover is, right? So like for fairly kind of small dimensions, you're better off using sieving. Of course, eventually you might run into problems of like where do you get all this RAM from, then routing to RAM becomes a problem. But for things that, uh, at least for you know practical dimensions, like sieving is really the thing um, that um, kind of is the fastest. And to illustrate this, there's something called the Darmstadt Hermit SVP challenge, where you ask to find short vectors in a lattice. And it was dominated by enumeration type algorithms, um, of course, because those were kind of the kind of efficient ones. Um, and then um, you, and you can see, so the uh, dotted red line is how much we would expect it to cost to solve SVP exactly. The green line is what the theory would predict how long it should take to um, solve these problems using enumeration type algorithms. And as you can see, that somewhat matches with kind of what's then actual implementations achieved. And then you can see sieving uh, kind of is just significantly faster kind of than these enumeration type algorithms. You can do even better by using GPUs. Uh, the idea is to stream your database of vectors to the GPU, and then you use some uh, low precision inner products there to do these pairwise checks. Uh, I don't quite know how to compare kind of GPU and CPU times. So maybe the best thing to uh, kind of note here is 
note that the experiments um, on the previous slide, which was CPU-driven sieving, end at dimension 160. Um, and this is where this table starts, right? So this table starts at a thing that kind of takes nine hours in dimension 158 and go up, go up to dimension 180 in uh, 51 uh, um, days, right? So like it's significantly faster kind of using this on GPUs. And as I mentioned, you can you can try all of this at home, right? All of this is open source and available. And um, so um, try it, contribute. The how to cost SIFs exactly. So for enumeration, we have pretty good ideas for how this behaves, right? So we have um, models for how to kind of what we expect in terms of cost of enumeration based algorithms and our implementations like fairly, fairly precisely match that. For sieving, it's, it's not so clear. So we have these small scale implementations, but they kind of it, they don't need to implement the full algorithm because the dimensions are too small for everything really having to come into play. And then also lower order term matters. So this Matsov paper that I mentioned earlier, one of their contributions is that they improve a lower order term. So when it comes to using these codes to decide which bucket you land in, they, uh, they have a, a slightly better ver version of like how to decide which, uh, which bucket you land in. And that gave them kind of a, quite a big improvement. Um, and then on the other hand, Leo then kind of wrote, uh, um, wrote a paper talking about like, okay, but you're making a lot of idealistic, uh, idealized assumptions about like, you know, these angles and probabilities of success. And so if we actually take all of that into account, then it becomes a bit more expensive. So it's an open question at the moment of like, how do you precisely kind of cost a SIF? Like, um, you know, we have some estimates, but like these estimates are kind of, you know, in dispute. Um, and the second big open question is like, how well does this thing actually parallelize in a non-uniform memory access regime? Right. And so a big difference in terms of costs is when you use ADPS 16, which is this core SVP methodology, then you get like for um, block size 500, you get something like uh, 146 in terms of cost. But if you then use the Kyber one, which is based on like um, some work we've done um, of like a cost model for sieving, and then the improved Matsov one, then you get 176, and then the improvement from Matsov is 169, right? So like there's a, and this is only improvement in low order terms, and that's still a little bit in flux. So don't assume that these estimates are precise for like things like 10 bits. I think they can go up or down um, in that range um, over the next few years when, as we figure out how to cost these things correctly. All right, I'm almost at the end. Let me talk about some quantum stuff. How do you do quantum for sieving? Well, we have an exhaustive search. Like we, for each vector, we're looking for a vector in a database that kind of uh, makes it reduce. So we can use Grover's algorithm for that. And we can also uh, use, uh, for enumeration, we can use Montanaro's quantum backtracking algorithm to get a quadratic speed up. Um, the problem with the uh, Grover's approach to sieving is that uh, the speed up for quantum sieving is quite mild. And um, roughly speaking, the problem that you have is that Grover's algorithm is really great for unstructured search, right? If you have a database of size n, then it needs square root n iterations in order to find a distinguished element. But the search space that we have here is very structured, right? So we use these buckets, for example, to subdivide our search space. So the quadratic search, where we then kind of rely on unstructured search, is actually quite small because we use the structure of the search space the things, you know, like that are close to, if two things are close to each other and to a third thing, then, you know, the first two things are also close to each other. That came out wrong, but I guess uh, the idea is clear. And in particular, if you just naively run slap Grovers on like the Gauss sieve, which is the simplest sieve that I explained, then you get a quantum complexity of 0.3 as a leading constant in the exponent. And if you use the structure, you get the same complexity on the classical computer. So we just have very small lists in which we kind of can use Grover's algorithm. So the kind of quantum sieving uh, speed up is, is quite mild, right? It's not that much. 
Um, and then in addition, there are questions of like, what's the overhead, right? So because there's also some, some quantum overhead. And so what we try to do is like give uh, some, some, some cost estimates of like how expensive would it be to implement these sieving oracles. And in some sense, the circuits that you need are quite small because you can do it all with an XOR and a pop count. So it's a quite small quantum circuit. So it's not that bad. But still, um, the crossover for like um, in our model for like classical um, uh, classical ceiling was in dimension kind of 400 or something, and even in dimension 1000, which is like way more than you would need to have uh, kind of security. Uh, kind of like it's quite mild, like um, I didn't quite know, but it's maybe 10 bits or something of difference. So it seems, um, at least as far as our estimates are concerned, like it's just not kind of not much of a speed up. But even then, the quantum estimates, they don't really matter. Um, and the, the, and the, the problem here is that um, for a crypt analyst uh, kind of who has a quantum computer, is that what's the point of comparison? And the kind of standard point of comparison would be AES, right? So you say like, well, you know, I want my lattice based scheme to be as hard as it is to break AES. And if you have AES 128, then you expect on a classical computer a workload of 2 to the 128, and on a quantum computer a workload of 2 to the 64 ish uh, because of Grover's algorithm. So that means uh, we parameterize our lattice scheme so that it have an attack cost of 2 to the lambda of 2 to the 128 or something. And then because the quantum speedups are so moderate, they are far away from the 2 to the 64 that we would need to actually even kind of take them into consideration. So at the moment, so say your quantum attack takes 2 to the 100 quantum operations, like however you kind of define this, then you know, that still wouldn't be a reason to revise any parameters because it's still quite far away from 2 to the 64. So in that sense, you can, you can at present, you can almost just ignore quantum security estimates for your schemes because like it's like I don't know of an example where the quantum estimates actually kind of makes you revise your security uh, kind of uh, your, your parameters because like the thing is that you need to meet is the classical attacks and then if you do that then the quantum attacks don't make that much of a difference. Finally, uh, some approaches I didn't talk about the BKW is you know combinatorial techniques. Um, and um, unless your secret is uh, unusually small or sparse, then you don't really need to worry about BKW. Aurora G is quite nice. It codes the whole thing as a nonlinear system, but noise free. Um, and then you compute a Gribner basis. Um, and you don't have to worry about this unless you give out a lot of samples and have constant size errors. So both of these are kind of usually not that relevant. To, to parameters that, um, as they are kind of found in the wild. All right, that's all I wanted to cover today. And I will finish with my usual we are hiring slide. But like for now, let's take some questions and discussion points. Hello, thank you for your talk. May I have a question? Yes, please. Uh, we are working on some modifications to, to multi-key, multi-party TFHE, and we are particularly interested in changing the uh, the secret key distribution, as you were talking about in the beginning. Uh, you were talking about the binary versus uh, binomial or Gaussian, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's more important for the key? Is it uh, the entropy of the distribution, or is it uh, the variance? I mean, if you have large variance and you also have sufficiently large entropy, right? So I think it's really kind of think of it as a standard deviation. I think that will be kind of for these attacks, the kind of uh, kind of the key datum. Uh, and then, of course, if you just kind of, you know, write the same number five kind of many times, then, like, you know, that's also big, but like easy to predict. So, yeah, if you think about the standard deviation, then like that will also cover your own entropy. Yeah, sure. So let's say uh, let's say we we stay at uh, if we have zeros one, so with fifty percent probability, it's one bit of entropy. Uh, okay, so if we change this into zero mi one minus one, let's say uh, with one bit of entropy, 
would this make any change to the error estimate? What's the intuition about this? So you you make some sort of combinatorial step slightly more expensive, right? Because you now have to kind of guess more uh, more components. Um, but the kind of in terms of the lattice attacks, like it, it's not that much. But I think it's I think what you probably do in the end is you probably run it through some estimator and like uh, get some uh, get some numbers out because like it's then if like you know if things are sparse and then you know maybe kind of the guessing part kind of becomes more relevant. It's a bit it's a bit hard to say, but I think it's even if you make a change, then you just need to crank up the dimension slightly to compensate for it. Yes. Okay. So we try to estimate her. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, hello. Uh, can I ask a uh, question? I think you probably uh, touch a little bit in, on this topic um, about the mass of attack and cost the difficulties of costing the uh, memory um, memory model. There was a lot of uh, a, a little bit of uh, elaboration on the forums about what would be the uh, costing for the particular parameters of Kyber. But can you uh, I don't know, comment to what is your feeling about how is this how, what what is the growth or is this any any applicable for FPG type of parameters or um will it be a realistic model yeah i think like so you would kind of once this so it will be relevant to FPG parameters right so like it's it's um, so the, if we figure out kind of how to cost attacks on Kyber correctly, then we probably kind of went a far way kind of for estimating the cost of breaking FHE parameters, because it's really the same techniques and maybe, you know, you chuck in kind of a bit of combinatorics here or there, right? So I think it's really kind of like, so if you make progress on that, then we also make progress on FHE probably kind of the cost will be kind of a lot more in a model where you take memory access into account but i'm really not a good person to kind of give you a guesstimate of like how much oh, thanks thank you Martin, I think we have a question in the chat. Yeah. So, um, sure. So, Ring LWE. Um, so, essentially, we pretend Ring LWE is LWE when we estimate parameters. So, um, we don't know for like, you know, properly chosen Ring LWE instances. We don't know of a way of having attacks that are significantly faster and even even fact by like you know noticeable polynomial factors so we just pretend this is lwe so you know you just say like my dimension ring dimension is 1024 well i guess that's my secret distribution then that's it like that's how we cost these things at the moment um so same for module LWE, right? So we just use the same thing and just pretend that these are LWE samples. Then on Sandbox AQ, uh, we do post quantum um, in the real world for business to business. So asking kind of how can we actually kind of transition to post quantum cryptography. Thanks, Alan. May, may I ask a, a, another question? Um, are there any um, conjectures that um, are out there that uh, I'm obviously not at all from this era, so any conjecture that people are trying to or going after or maybe something that you are, are you able to verify or simulate whether a conjecture um, is true or not in terms of mm -hmm complexity mm -hmm. if my so, question makes any sense yeah yeah it's actually i love it it's a great question big fan of the question so um 
So one of the reasons why kind of people like lattice-based cryptography is because we actually kind of have some, some, some good evidence that these problems are hard, right? So for finding actually a shortest vector is an NP-hard problem. Uh, and cryptography doesn't rely on parameters that kind of would put us in this range, but we then have some other complexity theoretic um, reasons to believe that, uh, you know, under some kind of other standard complexity theoretic assumptions, like, yeah, like these, these, these problems kind of remain hard. So, so we have some good evidence that these are actually hard problems, finding short vectors in the lattice. And we have a proof by Regev, that's when he introduced the LWE problem. Actually, if you can solve LWE, then you can find short vectors kind of um, in a lattice. And so in that sense, that's great. We have the theoretical evidence. But the, um, and now, how do you pick parameters, right? Because that's an asymptotic statement. So indeed, well, the proof that we have is if you break a random LWE instance, you can break any, um, any shortest vector instance with some approximation factor, right? So give me your worst instance, the hardest instance, and, like, and I have an oracle that solves LWE and I can solve your instance. So that's super cool. But the thing is, how hard is it to solve a worst case SVP instance? We don't know. So then you have to do exactly the thing that we're doing here of like actually kind of studying algorithms for solving these to say like, yeah, we expect this thing to be exponential time, but what's the leading con uh, constant in, uh, in my exponent even? So even if you complexity theory gives you confidence, it's like this thing will be, you know, I will only find exponential time algorithms. Um, then you still need to work out like, well, what's 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 the numbers that I plug in when I actually then want to deploy this, right? When I want to deploy FHE, I need to say like my lattice dimension is going to be this and it better costs more than two to the 100 operations in order to break it. I hope that answered your question. If not, let me know. Thank you. And in, in, a, in a similar way, uh, Helda, like what's, what's the mathematical equation? It's like, so... Um, so Sylvia Michali once said, cryptographers seldom sleep well. And the reason for that is like, we don't have a proof that things are fine. All we have is assumptions. So everything we do is based on the assumed hardness of certain computational tasks. Um, and in this instance, it is the assumption that it's hard even on a quantum computer to find short vectors in a lattice. It's a problem that many people have studied. So maybe we have some confidence in making this assumption, but it remains an assumption. And so what we then have, if you trust me or trust the community that this is indeed a hard problem, then LWE is hard. Because if you can solve LWE, you can find short vectors in a lattice using a quantum computer. So in that sense, that then we can prove. But here then the caveat from the previous question comes in. I can prove that this is true, but what are the actual numbers? So there we don't know. Like how long does it actually take? And LWE does not have origins in AI. So I don't think, so yes, it's called learning, but like the, it's a more broadly learning theory. So like think of it as noisy linear algebra. Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, but are, are you aware of uh, AI implementations in terms of solving the, uh, the, the LWE um, problem? This will not work. So this is a, a doomed attempt because you're spending time training your AI system to learn how to do modular arithmetic. So like we, with dedicated algorithms, like it's a hard problem distinguishing LWE samples from uniformly random. So the structure, like there is not this structure that you would typically uh, exploit in like your, your standard approach of like training some model on, on these systems. So that is, I definitely <laughs> say, I'm gonna put my like bet a thousand quid <laughs> that um, this is not a viable strategy. Okay. It's uh, it's just that uh, AI tends to find sort of solutions to problems that that we're not particularly aware of. Um, um, I mean, I'm 
for myself, I'm working on, on a certain solution to the uh, RSA problem, which uh, I've had some success that for completely unconventional approaches to that. Um, the whole thing about my first question is really, I mean, looking at Shannon's in original paper where he defines security as effectively where the uh, conditional entropy of a solution is more than, well, more than one, yeah? There must be two or more solutions. Um, sorry, I'm old school. I'm old school cryptanalyst, old school military code breaker. Um, the one thing that, that we've basically been working on is, 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 is one of cave uh, Shannon's caveats was that uh, we, in, in terms of him defining practical secrecy systems, he said that you could use a complicated mathematical problem, but he said, that uh, as a caveat, he said that it is insufficient for us to basically uh, uh, be sure that the system is um, sort of uh, secure against, and by secure as in conditional entropy not equal to, to zero, where one unique solution. He said that um, the, uh, it is insufficient for us to be sure that all known attacks, that the system is secure against all known attacks. The system must be secure against all possible attacks. And I'm always basically looking when I evaluate a system to see that the system is, 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 has that level of security. Um, and, and ordinarily, um, we normally have assumptions lined up. And the problem with assumptions is they are known to some and not known to others. And there are people that have solutions to problems which are not publicly known. And so it puts a big question around sort of having a subjective uh, definition to, to cryptography. But um, that's another discussion that we can have at some other time. Thank so you. the internet runs on this, on cryptographic assumptions. Um, I'm afraid um, it will continue to run on cryptographic assumptions and it would be an earth shattering moment if somebody finds a polynomial time algorithm for finding shortest vectors on lattices. So they, Okay. Of course, we have to study and then like, you know, like there might be kind of some, you know, we add some structure to them, there might be questions, but like the it's it's a big ask to say like this really kind of like, you know, there's a polynomial time algorithm in the future of solving these problems. We don't know. Maybe, maybe it can be discovered, but like the is it's quite an ask. It's if lattices fail, they will not fail completely. I would be very surprised by that. Okay. I mean, technically speaking, I mean, P is equal to NP. Uh, it's P is equal to NP for some conditions of some systems, and it's not for some conditions of some systems. It's not sort of a generalistic sort of one solution covers everything, really. Okay. But uh, listen, um, great uh, presentation. I mean, thank Thanks. you very much for making things so simple to, to everyone. Thank you. Okay. Then on Kyber. Um... I mean, I mean, sure, they're fine. <laughs> I think that so like the problem with these kind of like parameter discussions, like so like at the moment we're mostly discussing on like this Kaiba 512, right? So it doesn't quite meet the bar um, of like what was set as the goal by NIST. And then in in some sense, it makes sense to set a bar, right? So so people know what to target. Um, but then the like you have you've I don't know how many bits they're below the bar now, right? But like the kind of you a few bits below, and then the question is like, yeah, once you take memory into account, once you take parameterization into account, like are you still below the bar? Are you above the bar? So there's a lot of uncertainty of like we give these numbers, right? And then it's it's almost a bit uh, strange that the estimator gives you like even a digit after you know like the first digit, uh, you know like 120.9 no one in the world can predict the complexity of a lattice reduction algorithm in those dimensions to that precision right so you have like plus minus 10 bits and so like if you want to kind of like be conservative then either go a level up or just if you can design your own parameters just just add 20 bits mm. Okay, and the question is, but how do you choose the parameters for doing the lattice time? I'm not quite sure what the number of enumerations is, maybe the number of vectors you put out. 
So it becomes essentially a distinguishing problem. You get two distributions out and you want to know how many samples do of this distribution do I need to distinguish them. And then that's the number of uh, short vectors that you need. Um, and then you also need to spend time on these samples to distinguish them. And then it becomes a question of like, how do I trade off the reduction time versus then the distinguishing time? All right, I think that's all the questions. All right, thank you, Martin, for doing this uh, great talk. I think we have no more questions, indeed. Um, guys, thank you all for joining. I think we'll put the resources online on the website, maybe tomorrow or Thursday. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah, good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.